to the chair speakers and the audiences of this fresh new SNS webinar in the month of May. And we are extremely glad to introduce you to our first speaker, who is our honored guest from Brazil, Professor Jean Gonzalez de Oliveira. Professor Oliveira graduated from medical school at Federal University of Para and accomplishes neurosurgical training at the Federal University of Sao Paulo, Unifes, Sao Paulo, SP, Brazil. He did his fellowship in cerebrovascular and skull base surgery at Frankfurt University, Germany, where he developed a research study about non invasive intraoperative cerebral angiography during intracranial aneurysm surgery, whose final publication resulted in PhD at the Department of Neurosciences at the University of Sao Paulo. Dr. De Oliveira got the CNS International Fellowship Award in 2006 and was trained by Dr. Fetzler at the BNI Phoenix, Arizona, focusing in the neurosurgical treatment of cerebrovascular and skull base lesions. After his return to Brazil, he became the head of cerebrovascular and skull base surgery at the Center of Neurology and Neurosurgery Associate Sena Hospital Beneficia Portuguese de Sao Paulo, Brazil. Currently, he is a professor of neurosurgery at the Santa Casa de Sao Paulo School of Medical Sciences, where he is involved in patient assistance care, medical graduates and residents teaching and research. Professor Oliveira is a member of the editorial board and reviewer of several international medical journals. His clinical interests of focus include neurosurgical management of cerebrovascular diseases, intracranial aneurysms, AVMs, cavernous malformations, and neuro-oncology like brain tumors, gliomas, meningiomas, and skull-based tumors. We are extremely honored to have him today with us and he'll be talking about skull-based approaches and microsurgical nuances of paraclinoid aneurysms. The chair for today's session will be Professor Naoki Otani from Tokyo, Japan. He is Associate Professor and Director in the Department of Neurosurgery at the Nihon University Hospital, Tokyo. He is an integral part of the ACNS and an important member of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society. He has published several articles in various period journals. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Oliveira. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of the Yoko Kata, I would like to welcome both the chair and speakers as well as the audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinar. A very warm welcome to our audiences in China and we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Lubun Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today and with that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Otani. So thank you so much, Dr. Raja. Pleasure to be here and uh, Anna of introducing first speaker, Professor uh, Jean de Oliveira. So entitled uh, Skull Base uh, Approaches and Microsurgical Nuance for uh, Paracrinoid Aneurysms. So there are any uh, surgical uh, technical tips in direct surgery for these aneurysms? So I have been looking forward to these lectures. So please, uh, let's get started and take your time, um, Professor Oliveira. Can you share the uh, slide, please? So first of all, I'd like to thank the Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons Committee uh, for this uh, uh, kind invitation to be with you today. Uh, for me, it's an honor and pleasure to talk with uh, such a great uh, uh, community and neurosurgical community. And I hope you can be uh, in person soon in some, some other meeting. Uh, and today, uh, I'm going to talk about a school-based approach and microsurgical nuances for paracleidal aneurysms. Uh, be comfortable to interrupt me for any questions, but we, I, I believe we have a plenty of time at the end for also to discuss it. So I have no disclosure about this presentation. And before, before we go directly to the point of paraclinal aneurysm, we have to remember that Cerebrovascular lesions, aneurysms, AVMs, cavernous malformations, and AV fistulas, they have something in common. All, all of those can be curable yeah, surgically. That's, that's an important point. It's a disease that can be cured. So this, this is a very important point. And the, the, best available data in the literature 
according to the three class A studies, the Finnish study, the ISAT study, and the BRAT study, and all, all follow-ups, uh, one year, three years, six years, 10 year follow-up, show, show us that the, the chance for cure is very high when you use microsurgical clipping for aneurysm when you compare with coiling. So we we are offering to the patient uh, the best the best uh, what we have with the best evidence, which is microsurgical clipping. This is the very important point before you, we go directly to the paraclide aneurysm because the morbidity when you follow those patients in the breath study show us is very very beautifully in any in any point of the follow-up six months one year three years six years ten years there's no difference between morbidity clip and coil and also the mortality there's no difference so we we must to to take in account that that morbidity and mortality it's it's equal when you compare clip versus coil. So microsurgical clipping is the best management for aneurysm when you intend to cure the patient. Uh, however, we should we should to analyze patient by patient individually. We have to analyze the characteristics of the patient, the age, the clinical condition, psychological condition, and also the angio architecture of the aneurysms, the symptoms, the, if they are single or multiple. So there are so many important features that should be analyzed before you decide what to do, what to offer for each patient. So also it's very important. But when, when you see a surgery like this, where you have you have the anatomy in your hands, we you split the sylvan fissure. You have the whole microvascular anatomy. You clip the here in this case it's MCA and so you are seeing the anatomy. You have the microsurgical technique. You have the function from SSAP, MP, and now with the ICG, you have the blood flow analysis. So there is no other technique that offer for you so many information in a single procedure. So that, that is the main point. When you, when you perform a microsurgical clipping, you can have your anatomy technique function and blood flow analysis so the, that that's why this is the first option for treatment uh, of the aneurysms so going going to this is a short introduction about why we perform microsurgical clipping for our patients as a first option uh, with regard to the paraclidian aneurysm, when you go to the literature, uh, you see at least 27 different names to talk about the same thing. Uh, that is uh, aneurysm arising from the carotid artery since it leaves the cavernous sinus up to the origin of uh, posterior communicating artery. So this is a short segment of the carotid artery but any aneurysm arising from this segment can be called paraclinal aneurysm, despite we can find other names in the literature. When, when we face a patient uh, with aneurysm in this segment, we have to provide as many information as we, we can, uh, referring these patients for angiography, MRI, angio CT, because any one of those images can provide different kind of information. So using angiography, you can see the flow inside the vessels. Using MRI, you can 
we can find the relationship between the aneurysm in the, the encephalic uh, uh, structures. And you can also see if there is some part that is trom thrombosed or not. And also with the angle CT, you can see the relationship between this uh, aneurysm with the skull base and also the other vessels. So every single examination can provide us different information. And for, for a complex aneurysm like that, you have to, to perform a, a very detailed neuroradiologic assessment. And that, that assessment should include uh, 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 the neuro, the, the, the uh, angio CT coronal to see the relationship between this very small piece of bone, which is the optic strut, with the aneurysm. When the aneurysm is upward, that usually it is inside of subarachnoid space. When, when it's downward, that usually it is inside the cavernous sign. But we never know when, when, the, when a piece of this aneurysm or the whole aneurysm is inside of the cavernous sign completely, or, or if any part of this aneurysm can be inside of subarachnoid space and, and of course, can cause some subarachnoid hemorrhage in the future. So this is an important uh, uh, concern uh, to make sure that the, the aneurysm is completely inside of the cavernous sign or if any part of the aneurysm is reaching the subarachnoid space. The other important thing is to perform a balloon test occlusion because we have to analyze the collateral uh, circulation, uh, especially when you are dealing with a giant and large uh, aneurysm in this segment, because sometimes you have to sacrifice the carotid artery, or even during the surgery, you, you can uh, do it inadvertently. So you have to analyze before the, uh, the, the collaterals using the balloon test occlusion. So uh, uh, the, the neuroradiological assessment should, should include all those uh, techniques. And we cannot forget that this segment of carotid artery is very close to the anterior optic pathways. So also you have to have a neuroophthalmologic assessment for every single patient in order to, to analyze that. Remember that at the beginning of the visual deficit, some patients do not feel they are losing vision. So the campimetry can provide us this information at, at the ver very early beginning before the patient uh, you start to feel that they are losing vision. So this is very important. Okay, so how about the classification of paraclidal aneurysm? Also we, in the literature, you can find so many different classification systems. For us, especially when you are, are planning to perform microsurgical management, uh, I'd like to simplify it. Uh, Classifying uh, aneurysms that are going upwards, usually in relationship with the ophthalmic artery, and those that are uh, projecting downward. Also, those that are in the medial wall. In the medial wall, when you, you don't have a cave space, usually they are called hypophysio, superior or hypophysio aneurysm. When you have this, is more a medial recess, uh, it can be called carotid cave aneurysm. For those aneurysm projecting upwards, uh, we have to clip it using straight or curved clips, like you see right here. For those in projecting downward, we have to reconstruct the carotid artery using fenestrated clips. So that, that's a very simple classification, but it's very useful when you are planning to clip so the aneurysms. Another very important thing is to understand the anatomic 
aspect and starting uh, from the bony anatomy. The bony anatomy at this vision is very important because in most of the cases we, we have to remove partially or completely this small piece of bone, which is anterior clinoid process. And to understand that, we have to see the points where the anterior clinoid process is attached to a sphenoid ring uh, uh, bone. So when you want to remove this, uh, if you go directly to these three points, we can remove the anterior clinoid process as a single piece, which uh, saves you some time during the surgery. When we remove the, this small piece of bone, we can see you expose this segment of the uh, carotid artery, which is the clinoid segment. Here is the optic strut. Here is distal dura ring. Here is a uh, 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 subarachnoid uh, uh, ophthalmic. Uh, uh, ophthalmic is right here, origin. And this is carotid after it enters in the dura uh, uh, subarachnoid space. So this is a very complex anatomy. It's not easy to understand it in the very first beginning. So we have to, to give the credit for Professor Vinko Dolenk who taught us how to, to deal with the aneurysm arising from that. And I have to say that even seeing very, very good people doing surgeries, looking videos, uh, watching videos, uh, going to uh, courses and see books, the only way to understand this anatomy is going into the lab and dissecting, dissecting, dissecting specimens. So this is the only way to understand that. You see, so when you go to the lab and by your own hands, and then you can see uh, the whole anatomy, every single structure here is the, after remove the clinoid, you see distal dura ring, clinoid segment of carotid, carotid supraclinoid here, right here, optic nerve, third nerve, fourth nerve. So you see the whole anatomy. You have to go to the lab. You have to go so many uh, times you can. So that is my, my main advice in, in this presentation, go to the lab and practice the anatomy, practice the technique. So this is the best and the only way to understand the anatomy and to improve your, your techniques. So the microsurgical principles of the, of the uh, paraclinal aneurysm should include the positioning, sylvan fission opening, anterior clinoid process drilling and clipping. It's a very stepwise procedure. Uh, there are some, some neurosurgeons that go directly to, to the clinoid, go directly to the aneurysm, but I have to say that if you go step by step, it's gonna be a, a, a easier procedure. Regarding the, the positioning, we do not extend the head when you are uh, planning to clipping a paraclinal aneurysm. Because when you, when you extend the head, you are become far away from the skull base. And the skull base is going to be in the very deep part of the, the surgical field. So for paraclinal aneurysm, we keep the head in parallel, parallel to the ground. This is a very important point. The surgery should start on the neck to have a proximal control. So this is the neck, this is the, the head. So the surgery should start in the neck, dissecting the carotid heart to have the proximal control. Proximal control, it's a paramount step in the cerebrovascular surgery. We have to have the proximal control for every single case when you are dealing with cerebrovascular lesions. 
I'd like to, to introduce you to this very, very new book that I have the privilege to publish along with Professor Louis Borba. Uh, it's, a, it's a microsurgical endoscopic approach to the skull base. It's a, a stepwise, uh, a very well illustrated book for every single approach that you have for the skull base. So I recommend you to, 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 to read this because here we, we can see everything that I'm going to talk to you this, uh, in this lecture. Uh, starting, starting with the most, the most common approach that we perform in the neurosurgery, which is the Teriono approach, I would say that for, for, most, for most of the paraclidal aneurysm, Teriono approach, it's enough. You don't have to, to remove more bone than you remove in the Tiriono approach to perform a microsurgical clipping of paraclinal aneurysm in 95% of the case. So uh, I'm going to show you uh, in, in a stepwise form, but it's Tiriono approach is very, very uh, enough to this kind of aneurysm. Of course, when you have uh, large and giant aneurysms, uh, optozygomatic approach can provide a, a, a wider exposure and also different kind of angles of approach for the aneurysm. So sometimes when you remove uh, the orbital ring, we can have different kind of angles of approach. It's not, it's not only what you are seeing in the surgical field, but, but also the angle that you that the approach can provide you so th this is very important uh, i'm 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 going to start with this very very interesting case which is a a, a lady 61 years old pre presented with bilateral paraclinal aneurysm which is a not so hair situation for women uh, to have a bilateral paraclinal aneurysm is it's, it's not so hair. Uh, I, I have a series of cases. And she was presented with a left visual depth. And when you see the MRI, you see a large uh, upward project in the left side, but also another aneurysm in the right side projected downward. So this is a very illustrative case. And we perform uh, angiography seeing the left side, the upward projecting, then the uh, right side, a downward project in the same page. So this is inter interesting. So this is the angio MRI. So the first, the first aspect in the surgery after you perform a teriono approach, and a wide opening of the sylvan fissure. I hope I hope the video is running well for you. Is, is this okay, the video? Yes, Prof. Oh, good. So you see that we are we are uh, placing uh, what we call a pilot clip. The first clip that you apply. Look at how the aneurysm was compressing the optic nerve. So after you put the pilot clip, we start to decompress the optic nerve. Look at how that compression was causing an impression over the, the optic nerve. And I'm placing another clip in parallel. And look at the, the compression was over the 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 tritary stalk, and also we have a, a small residual there, and suction decompression can help help us during the surgery, as you see right here. And now, using a fenestrated clip, we are closing that residual that was right here, and still have some. Uh, coagulation is it's, uh, another important technique that helps us to occlude and, and decrease in size the aneurysm. And this, this was a small remnant 
that first we coagulate and then place another thing. Uh, note, note that we didn't remove the clinoid in this case. So this is a very illustrative case for those who ask you, uh, do you remove the clinoid extradurally or intradurally? It's a very common uh, question during the meetings. Yeah. Do you go for paraclinoid and do you go extradurally or intradurally? I always go intradurally, like you see here. Why? Because if in this case we go uh, uh, extradurally, you go to remove the clinoid, and you see that after you open the dura, you don't need to remove the clinoid in, in every single case. So the only way to know if you need to remove clinoid uh, completely or partially, or you don't not to remove that, you don't need to remove that, is to open the dura and, and look at the relationship between the carotid or uh, anterior clinoid process and the aneurysm. If I, if I need to remove that, it, it was to open this small piece of the dura and drill it. So this is an important thing. So another important thing is to perform the post-operative angiography. The post-operative angiography is the only way to make sure that you have occluded the aneurysm completely and also uh, the preservation of the ophthalmic artery and the preservation of the whole cerebrovascular tree. And so this is very, very important to perform the post-operative injury. Three months later, we operated the other side, which was a completely different situation. This, this was a, also large aneurysm, but in this case, I had to open the cavernous sinus. So look at here, we are removing the dura that covers the, the clinoid, the anterior clinoid process. I, I don't like to keep this piece of the dura right here because it, it can wrap during the drilling. So this is the third nerve. This is the anterior clinoid process. So that's why I'm removing the dura that covers the anterior clinoid process. See, the other reason is right here. So I need to open, to open it. So I go directly to the points where the anterior clinoid process is attached. When, when we have some bleeding come from the bone, you can easily stop it using bone walks. When we have uh, uh, bleeding coming from the cavernous sinus, we have to use some fibrin glue. So after you go directly to the point, so you see the clinoid is completely free. But be careful because the tip of the clinoid, it's, it's, uh, as you can see, is very sharp in some situations like that. So be careful to not perforate the, the carotid with this. So after that, you can see here the clinoid segment. You can see the distal dura ring. Remember that the distal dura ring cannot be detached. You have to cut it. So you see that we still have some small piece of bone in the optic strut higher right here, so that's why I'm drilling a little bit more. Now I can see the medial aspect of the carotid, the lateral aspect of sphenoid uh, sinus, the origin of the, of the ophthalmic artery, and I'm cutting the distal dura ring in the whole circumferential aspect of the carotid. Uh, under the carotid, medial. So after you cut the whole uh, distal dura ring, now you, you see that you can displace the carotid easily. And now you have the proximal control inside uh, uh, the cranium. So I'm doing a trapping of the aneurysm, clipping before and after the aneurysm 
uh, neck and putting a fenestrated clip in order to reconstruct the character because it was a, a, a wide uh, neck and the reason I'm putting additional clipping to occlude the whole neck and checking the flow of the posterior communicating art and using microsurgical Doppler and also checking the flow in this small branch that is the the anterior choroidal uh, artery this is m1 and this is a1 so after you make sure that you occlude the whole aneurysms checking the flow here you can see the ophthalmic artery and that the aneurysm is completely occluded and then we start to section and decompress that the aneurysm also compress the optic uh, uh, nerve and also look at how attached it was in the pituitary stall. So it's important to decompress there. Again, a post-operative angiography, it's mandatory to make sure that you cure your patient. When you get a angiography like that, you you can be uh, more more than happy with the result and it's it's pretty much that you achieve the cure for the patient and because we decompress the nerve in the very early stage we could achieve a complete recover of the visual depth this is very important as early as you can decompress the nerve uh, will be uh, uh, higher will be uh, the chance of recover for the patient uh, so another another situation, a female 47 years old present with headaches, but again, visual deaths. It's very common in this in aneurysms like that. Uh, the first symptom is, is the visual deficit. So uh, it's uh, also it's very common that in the first uh, CT, you see a red, a large mass like you see right here. So when you see an uh, image like that, you the chance of to, it's going to be an aneurysm is very high. So it's mandatory to analyze the angiography. You see here uh, a giant aneurysm in this paraclinal segment. Look at how the aneurysm was displacing uh, A1 and M1. So it, that was a very large. And, and look, look at in the 3D reconstruction that the aneurysm was uh, englobing the origin of the uh, carotid in M1 right here. So in cases like that, we have to be prepared for a bypass because the, uh, in our in our practice, the first the first option it's always the clip reconstruction, okay? Because for the clip reconstruction, you know you know uh, what is going to happen in the long term follow up, and and bypass surgery we we don't know what's going to happen in the long term follow up, uh, we don't we don't have this data in the literature. So bypass surgery sh should be uh, in your armamentarium but should be an option for the clip reconstruct. But in cases like that, you have to be prepared for that. Uh, again, the balloon test occlusion, it's very important to understand if you can occlude or not occlude the carotid. In this case, I could occlude that. Uh, the patient pass through the balloon test occlusion. So here is the way how we do the pterionocraniotomy. We do the regular. We, we don't do a mini pterional, nano pterional approach, especially for large aneurysm like that. Uh, we have to, to be aware with the preservation of facial branch. Uh, we have to, to separate a, a pericranial to skull base reconstruction. And the exposure, we do not cut the temporal muscle, we just detach it uh, from the bone. And after the surgery, we can uh, uh, attach it again. 
Uh, this is a regular aptilion approach. And then this is very important to open the sylvan fissure. When you open the sylvan fissure, the, you cannot, you don't do retraction any longer. You just uh, uh, move or displace the temporal or frontal because when you cut the arachnoid, the temporal and the frontal lobe become free. And then you can displace, you can sustain the brain, uh, avoiding the uh, a real retraction. So look, look at here the carotid, and this is the third nerve right here. So to open a wide open of sylvan fissure, it's one of the most important uh, technique for this kind of lesion. And look at how the optic nerve was compressed into the optic canal. When you have situations like that, we have to open not only uh, the clinoid uh, bone, but also to open the optic canal. So look at that, I didn't touch in the aneurysm. I have the control in the neck, but before I start to dissect the aneurysm, I'm gonna decompress the nerve. See, so we are removing the dura that covers the anterior clinoid process and also that covers the bone of the roof of the optic canal. So having a, a drill that uh, runs only in the tip is very important. Look at that, that is covered. So this part is not, is not drilling, only the tip. So this is very important. Underwater to avoid uh, heat. So this is very important to remove the bone of uh, the optic canal. In, in this regard, we can decompress the Look at how optic nerve is compressed. And then after we remove, you see that it's going to be a completely different situation. So I'm drilling in the medial aspect of the nerve in the optic canal. In, in the lateral aspect, which is already the anterior clinoid process. I hope, I hope the video is running well for you guys. And again, we can stop uh, the bleeding using bone walks and also some fibrin glue when you have uh, bleeding coming from the cavernous sinus. Now we are removing the anterior clinoid process. This, this clinoid is not so large as the previous case, fibrin glue. And then now look at how we can open the dura of the optic canal along with the uh, uh, the ligament. And look at how the optic nerve is becoming free. And now you can start to dissect the nerve to see the origin of the ophthalmic artery right here. Now the nerve is no longer compressed, but you see that the compression cause lesion in this part of the nerve right here. But now the nerve is decompressed. So now you can manipulate it safely. Look at how it's free. Okay, then I start to cut the distal dura ring to see the origin of the ophthalmic artery right here. And now I have a different situation. So the skull base approach 
dealing like you see right here, I'm drilling a little bit more the optic strut to expose the distal dura ring. I'm cutting the distal dura ring in the lateral aspect, now in the medial aspect. So again, we have to cut it in the whole circumferential aspect. After you, you cut the whole circumferential aspect, you see right here, you see here, the origin of the ophthalmic, you have the proximal control in the, the clinoid segment. Remember the way that we have at the very beginning. Now look at the whole anatomy. When you remove the bone from the skull base, now you have the whole cerebrovascular anatomy in your hand. So this is the beauty of this approach. When you remove the bone, you have the control. So what I'm doing now is I'm closing the carotid in the neck and distally I'm, I'm doing a trap. And I'm starting to do a decompression, section decompression of that. And look at how the aneurysm is different now. After the surgical decompression, we have a completely different situation. And now remember that we were prepared for a bypass, but using a fenestrated clips, we could achieve a very good carotid reconstruction, avoiding a bypass for this patient. Also remember that the patient was very good in the balloon test occlusion. So I, I could occlude this carotid artery. But of course, for, for that patient, the, the best situation is to preserve the carotid artery. You see? So now you have a, a, a very, very different situation. It, for this segment, we use three fenestrated clips. This is the origin of the ophthalmic right here. And for the rest of the aneurysm sac, we put straight clips after the, the aneurysm neck. So it was a giant aneurysm. That's why you, you had to use so many clips. Look at here is the bifurcation of the carotid, ME1, A1. And now we perform an a, a intraoperative angiography with uh, fluorescein. And you can see here the preservation of the flow in the carotid. A1, M1, and also the perforating arteries from the anterior uh, uh, choroidal artery right here. This is very important, the perforating arteries. So that was very, very difficult aneurysm, but we can achieve a very good reconstruction uh, when you use a, a, a skull based approach to remove the bone and to expose the whole cerebrovascular structure. We published about the aneurysms compressing anterior optic pathways a long time ago. And in this paper, we, we could find different mechanisms uh, that can cause visual deficits. So in this situation, it is very common, which is direct compression. Look at how compressive was this nerve at this uh, part of the nerve where the aneurysm was compressed. Also, we can find the pulsation, as you can see here, the pul pulsation of the aneurysm under or over the nerve. And another situation was what we had in the previous case, which is the indirect compression of the nerve inside the optic canal. And also in some other uh, situations where you can find calcification and thrombus, where we have to open the aneurysms, uh, perform a suction decompression to remove the thrombose apart in order to put a clip in a better position. So, uh, those are different pathophysiological mechanisms to explain the visual deficits. 
So we cannot we cannot solve the visual deficit only uh, decompressing here or uh, when you uh, stop the pulsation. We have to identify all those mechanisms in order to solve every single one of them uh, to achieve uh, the best uh, visual uh, recovery results. So this is very important to understand that physiopathological is multifactorial, it's not a single factor. When we go to the literature and you see the, that endovascular management for carotid ophthalmic aneurysm, you have a very heterogeneous result regarding the complete occlusion from 21 to 82% only of total occlusion with a 53% of recurrent rate, 70% uh, need of retreatment and 40% complication. So uh, this is very important to understand that it's not an easy aneurysm even for endovascular. And regarding the visual deficit, you see that uh, using clipping, you have at least 70% against only 43% of ch chance of improve the visual depth. And more than that, you have a higher chance of worse the visual depth using the coiling. So this is very important data that comes from this, this meta-analysis in the literature. And why, why the patients uh, worsen the visual depths after endovascular, especially when you use coils? It's because of that. There's a very good explanation in the literature. When you, you perform a coiling treatment, the extension of the aneurysm sac can, can, can uh, 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 increase in uh, almost 34%, like we see in this paper. Uh, also, you can... We can see situations like that, uh, aneurysm sac fulfilled with coils, compress the nerve uh, as, as such a to mimic a tumor inside the optic canal. So in situations like that, we have to decompress the optic nerve. And also when you use uh, coils like biocoils, you can find uh, inflammatory reaction around the biocoils, as you can see here, which also can uh, uh, worsen the visual depths. It's another paper showing the same reaction. So this is very well illustrated. And sometimes you need to decompress the coil mass because the patient has getting, was getting worse uh, uh, about the visual depth. So there are, there are very, very clear situations in the literature showing that Coiling is not the best option for treated patients with visual deficits. Regarding aneurysms arising in the medial wall, I'm going to show you. Uh, look at this case. Uh, I, I operated this case during a live course uh, in Siberia. And look at this is rupture MCA, anterior uh, uh, choroidal water right here. Another aneurysm right here in superlateral aspect of the carotid. And this is what uh, is the medial wall of the carotid right here. So look at the, it's parallel uh, to, to, to the planum sphenoidal because it was not entering the, in the, the cave. So here you can see the ruptured MCA. Uh, Again, look at that. open the sylvian fissure. And in this case, we had a multiple intracranial aneurysm. So ICG can show you beautifully that is completely occluded. And now going to the other aneurysms, here's the anterior choroidal artery and the real, look at the anterior choroidal was arising from the, the base of the aneurysm. So that's why I'm placing the clip in diagonal aspect in order to preserve the, the origin of the ophthalmic, oh, sorry, the, 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 the coro anterior choroidal water right here. This is another, and, there is, and so where, where the medial aneurysm is, you cannot see because the carotid is attached here 
by the digital dura ring. So again, we have to open it, remove the dura that covers the carotid, uh, the, the, the clinoid. It's, it's more about the same, but it's very good to show that this is the, the way we can open the cavernous sinus, expose the, the uh, clinoid segment of the carotid, open or uh, remove the clinoid, expose the clinoid segment to cut the distal dura ring. And then when you cut the distal dura ring in the whole circumference, you can displace the carotid easily laterally, stop the bleeding, and now you, you can displace the carotid and see the energy, you see? Uh, in this case, we, we didn't have a, a nine degree uh, clip. So in this case, we decided to put three clips in a row, straight fenestrated clips in a row. So we could achieve a very good uh, uh, occlusion with that. And then ICG show us that we, we don't have flow into the endoris any longer and preservation of the flow in the carotid. So this, this is a very important interoperative information. Here, here is the postoperative angio CT. And I'd like to call your attention for this, this kind of projection of the energy. When, when you have a medial wall and, and there is projecting downward, not in parallel like in the previous case, you have to imagine that we have some space right here for this project. That was described for Professor uh, Kobayashi from Japan. Uh, who described this is more recess in the medial wall of the carotid. This was what he called cave. Here I have the great pleasure to, to have a dinner with Professor Kobayashi during the World Congress in Istanbul, in Turkey in 2017. And look, look at here, this, this is the cave, okay? So in the original paper, Professor Kobayashi described that in some situations you have a small cave like this, a big, a big cave like this one, and no cave. So cave was found in only 70% of the case. So you you must to, to keep it in mind that we don't have a cave in every single case. But when you have a, this small recess, the aneurysm is arising, arising it can be inside that. So this is what we call carotid cave. Sometimes the aneurysm is partially inside the cavernous side, partially inside the subarachnoid space. So this is very important. So this is an illustrative case. Uh, like you see, when you have this projecting downward, the aneurysm arising from the medial aspect of the carotid, the same, the same technique, proximal control in the neck, uh, position is parallel to the ground, not stained, terional craniotomy. Look at, where is the aneurysm? You cannot see nothing. You just see the optic nerve, uh, carotid. Here is the origin of ophthalmic, is distal in this case. Now we are opening the false form ligament. And then we're gonna to proceed to remove the clinoid, the same technique, going directly to the attached point of the clinoid in order to remove it in a single pace. Now we remove the clinoid. We have bleeding coming from the uh, 
Kevin Sinus. Using fibrin, fibrin glue, you can stop it easily. So you inject the fibrin glue and stop the bleeding. And look at how the anatomy is exposed after you remove the bone. So this curl base provides you this beautiful anatomy. Now I have the, the carotid uh, uh, clinoid segment, origin of the thumb. Now I can see the aneurysm right here. Look at the aneurysm in the ICG. So remove the bone, perform a uh, skull base approach. Remember that how it was at the very, very beginning, now how it was after remove the bone. And then here we put two straight fenestrated clips proximal to the ophthalmic artery and one uh, curved clip distal to the, the ophthalmic in order to achieve. Remember that in here in here we don't have too, too much space to put big clips. So uh, you have to find some creativity to find good clips to put in this very, very narrow space. Look at the, how beautiful it's ICG showing the flow into the carotid and then origin of ophthalmic is uh, the pre preservation. No, no aneurysm in flow any longer. And here is the post-operative angiography. Look at the configuration of the clip. We put two fenestrated clips. These tips of the clips, these occluding the aneurysm, and also they are inside of uh, the cave. And for the rest of the aneurysm, we use this curved clip. Uh, before I finish my, my talk, uh, I'd like to, to make some consideration about the uh, flow diverted. The flow diverted is a, a very common uh, technique used nowadays, but uh, this beautiful paper showed that when you put a, 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 a flow diverter, you can compromise the flow in up 32%, not to occlude the ophthalmic artery, but to compromise to change the flow in the ophthalmic artery in up to 32% of the case. So this is well illustrated in this case. And there's another publication, which is a randomized care trial and registry showing that we can have 10% of mortality, 50, uh, 48% of complications and to achieve only 58% of complete occlusion. So remember, flow diverted is not a good indication for rupted aneurysm. It's a better indication for unrupted aneurysm. So to have 10% mortality in unrupted aneurysm is too high. So uh, be careful when we indicate this technique. And more than that, in most of the cases of this series, we have to, to uh, perform a surgery after flow diverting in order to decompress the mass effect. So this is important. When you have any reason present with mass effect, uh, the surgery provides not only the cure of the aneurysm, but provides the chance of, of decompress the mass effect. There are two meta-analyses in the literature about the flow diverting. And both of them show you a complete occlusion in only 76% of the case, with the morbidity ranging from 5 to 10%, and the mortality around 4%. So, again, uh, indicate a technique that is indicated uh, only or mostly for unrooted aneurysm and having. 10% morbidity, 4% mortality, I don't think it's uh, the best for our patients. And when we compare 76% total occlusion with the series in the literature that perform post-operative angiography after microsurgical clipping, we're gonna see that we have around 94% of total occlusion 
in this series and in the the current series can can be even better with almost 100 percent of total occlusion post-operative angiography so uh, we have to think about uh, why indicate some things that occluded uh, the aneurysm 76 percent when you have the standard technique that provided almost uh, a nine five hundred percent of of cure so we have to think about that so in conclusion when you face a patient uh, with a paraclinal aneurysm we have to provide a very good neuroradiologic assessment neuroophthalmological assessment is very important we have to identify the pathophysiology that is causing the visual deficit, direct compression, pulsation, indirect compression, and, and the vascular compromise. Uh, we have to go to the lab to understanding the anatomy, to refine our microsurgical techniques. When you, we have a, 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 a compression over the, the optic pathways, we have to decompress as soon as possible Timing is very important here. We have to have some interoperative blood flow evaluation, ICG, angiography, microdoppler, any, any uh, of those tools is very important. The endovascular management uh, in our practice is uh, only for alternative in select patients because it provides lower rates of complete occlusion. It, it presents high rates of recanalization. Uh, it, it cannot be recommended for large and giant aneurysm. In, in our practice, it's a contraindication in patients with visual deficit. So I'd like again to thank you very much uh, for your attention. This is the building of Santa Casa de São Paulo. It's a beautiful building and everybody is most welcome to visit us anytime. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation, uh, showing your excellent technique and the basic concept of the uh, performing direct approach for paracranial aneurysms step by steps. So, uh, any question and comment from the panelist? Yes, of course, we can take questions and comments from the lead panelists. I'll start with Professor Kimura, Professor Hideito Kimura from Kobe is here. Any questions from oh. you? Oh, thank you, Raja. I'm Hideito Kimura. I'm a vascular neurosurgeon. So I have several questions for Professor Oliveira. Uh, thank you for your excellent lecture. And uh, I, I learned a lot uh, regarding the paraclinal annual surgery. I also performed surgery for this kind area. So when I treat a patient with a paracranial aneurysm, I always uh, special care for the uh, branch of the superior hypophysial artery. So, if, especially for the aneurysm projected medially, we need to confirm the, the origin of the superior hypophysial artery at every time, every surgery. So, how do you care about the technical tips to, to preservation? For their superior hypophysial artery. And then, uh, so, I, yeah, I have two okay. questions later. So thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I will answer that and then you make the other one. Otherwise, I can forget the first one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, first of all, Professor Kimura, thank you uh, for, for being here during this session. Thank you for your questions. Uh, I, I, I have to say that we we must to try to preserve any vessel during our aneurysm yeah. surgery, and the, uh, uh, the the superior hypophysial arteries should be preserved uh, uh, every time because it provides the 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 uh, the blood flow the uh, inferior aspect of the optic nerves and the chiasm yeah. so this this is very important to try to to preserve those small arteries uh, uh, in aneurysm like that of course when when you have a small or mid-sized aneurysm it's easier 
to dissect it, to find out that. Mm -hmm. But when you have a larger giant aneurysm, in most of the case, those, those small vessels are already displaced and stretched. And sometimes we perform the ICG before you start the dissection. And there is no flow uh, in those vessels because it was already uh, uh, stretched by the aneurysm. So uh, that's why it's very important to perform the ICG before you start the dissection in order to see which vessels should be uh, preserved and uh, which vessels are already with no flow. Mm -hmm. uh, for large and giant aneurysm is, is, is very difficult because sometimes these, these small vessels are already over the, the wall mm -hmm. of the aneurysm. They are very attached there. And in most of the cases, there's no flow any longer, but we have to try to dissect it in order to preserve uh, every time you can. I see. So before, uh, to do that, before approach to the aneurysm itself, you should uh, perform the first uh, decompression of the optic canal first. You, you talked in your presentation, very important concept. I, I, thought, I, thought I had totally agree with your opinion. Yeah, and my yeah. second question is, uh, so intradural anterior craniodectomy is uh, one of the, of course, most important uh, procedure in this surgery. I perform both extradural anterior, anterior craniodectomy and also intradural, also I, I, I select a patient to perform the, the each, to each procedure. So, so my, my question is, uh, what kind of uh, drill tips when you use an uh, anterior craniodectomy. So, so some, of course we need to pay attention to the avoidance of the heat injury of the optic nerve. So sometimes we tend to give heat uh, injury to the optic nerve directly. So to avoid this, uh, this uh, uh, complication, we have to choose the appropriate uh, proper uh, drill tips Diamond or a cross diamond or a fine diamond or what kind of what what size of the diamond what tip should be chosen? Please let me know about your opinion. Yeah, Thank you. yeah. First, first of all, uh, uh, it's it's very important to open the canal up the canal and then the reason is 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 displaced by mm -hmm. uh, yeah. when the optic nerve is displaced by the aneurysm and mm -hmm. and it is. Uh, yeah the optic canal. So yeah. when you open the optic canal, the the nerve is free again, and, and then you can manipulate safely. So this yeah. is in, very yeah. important. Regarding the anterior clinoid process removal, uh, the, remember the first case that I show you that it was there's no need for anterior clinoid removal. I could clip the aneurysm without to remove any piece of bone. Mm -hmm. So if in that case, I start to remove the clinoid extra durally before I open the dura, I would remove the whole bone unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. So when you open the dura, you see the situation inside, the relationship between the bone, the artery, the oh. aneurysm, the optic nerve, and then you tailor uh, how much you bone you need to remove and yeah. yeah. so yeah. that's why i go always intradural for tumor is different oh yeah for two for tumor for men meningioma is different extra dural is oh, better yeah. because mm -hmm. you have to to remove the bone you have to to coagulate the the dura and and the the vascularization especially mm -hmm. for meningiomas I see. And, and then it, i go extra dural Mm -hmm. But for any reason, I, I'll always go introduce it because in some situations you don't need to remove the clinoid or you need to remove just a piece of bone. You don't need to remove the whole clinoid. I see. So you, you tailor your approach for, for every single case. Yeah. yeah this is what uh, uh, I do. Yeah. And the si what, what are the size of the uh, drill tips? Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 
I, I like I like to use that that tip that do not run in the the segment. You have to 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 have a tip that run only in the very very tip. Mm -hmm. That it must More. be covered. It mm -hmm. must be covered because if it is not covered, it can wrap in some mm -hmm. vessel. It can wrap in a piece of dura. So we have to have a cover. Mm -hmm. I I. I I have to say that I like uh, to use at the beginning of the drilling a regular tip and to use the diamond tip only uh, when I am drilling very close to the to the mm -hmm. artery or to the nerve mm -hmm. and underwater underwater it's an underwater surgery because with water irrigation. We have uh, the risk of heating lesion is decreasing. I see. So, yeah. uh, so underwater surgery. Yeah, thank you. Very, very, uh, that that that's the way we do it. Yeah, I agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I under rocked. Uh, Pro Professor Kimura, thank you. Thank you very much for your thank considerations you. and with your question. It's a it's a great honor to me to be with you this session. Me too. Oh, yeah. I learned a lot. Thank you for your excellent presentation again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was indeed a very, very interesting discussion. May I also join the same? I would like to ask Professor, I'll first I'll say a uh, small comment that uh, re with regard to intradural and extradural clinodectomy, one of the consensus among general uh, neurosurgeons is that for an unruptured case, if it's possible, you can do an extra dural because there is always a guard of the dura between the drill bit and the aneurysm. Whereas in a rupture case, it is safer to go for an intradural cranodectomy. But also when you need a, a cranodectomy for PCOMs, as a, uh, when it is close to the clinoid, you may do a extra dural as well. And with regard to vision, you showed us very good uh, results. Uh, and I would like to ask if Professor uh, uh, Oliveira has uh, any cases where he found deterioration in vision after surgery. Yes, yes. Everybody that operates in the paraclidian will have cases with a decrease of visual deficit. It, it happens around 10% of the case, okay? If you, if you, if you hurt somebody that, that doesn't have any case of that, it's because they never operate paraclina in the reason. So uh, the, the, the risk of visual deaths after the surgery, it's around 10 to 15%. Right. What do you but, think are the reasons that might have influenced this outcome uh, i think i think the manipulation of the nerve before the compression yeah uh, uh, there are there are there are neurosurgeons that start the surgeon trying to clip the aneurysm and then after that they decompress it 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 must be on the contrary we we have to start with the 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 nerve nerve decompression and then we start to manipulate the aneurysm. Otherwise, you will manipulate the nerve uh, and the nerve is still uh, attached and, and compressed inside the optic canal. So this is a very important point. The other point is the heat from the drilling. So it must be underwater surgery uh, to avoid the, the, the heat lesion uh, in, the, in the nerve. Uh, and then, I would I I have to say that there there are some surgeons that do not understand the anatomy well how to deal with the 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 cavernous sinus surgery so uh, I would recommend to go to the lab to understand better the anatomy because it's not simple anatomy it's not it's not simple you have to understand this anatomy you have to to understand how to deal with the bleeding that comes from the cavernous sinus you have to to understand uh when to occlude the carotid in the neck uh, there are so many uh, uh 
different situations that you you can face during this surgery. So we have to be prepared for that. And the only way is going to the lab and practicing, practicing, practicing. Thank you very much. You showed us a case of direct suction decompression, right? And our yeah. chair today, Professor Naoki Otani, has a very good yeah. series of 20 cases where direct puncture of the carotid and retrograde <laughs> suction decompression was done. Yeah. And it's myself, a Dallas, Dallas, Dallas technique. Yeah. I, I also yeah. use that. I always, uh, I also use that. Uh, another, another possibility is to perform an endovascular uh, angiography interoperatively and put a balloon inside, and then you 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 do a combined approach with endovascular and microsurgery. And the 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 greatest advantage of that is that after you clipping, you you can perform an interoperative angiography and the same procedure. So. Uh, we 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 can do all of them. Uh, uh, suction decompression with puncture, you can put in the neck, and also you can can do uh, uh, endovascular uh, combined approach. That is true, but when you use an endovascular, there is always a risk of giving heparin, and your of course. surgery of course. may become messy. That is uh, one reason people avoid endovascular balloons. Of yeah. course, nevertheless, it's a very good technique. And uh, uh, we can have here from Professor Otani for the yeah. comments. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for Dr. Raja. So may I ask a question? So do you, do you use uh, uh, visual evoked potential monitoring during the uh, so surgical operation? Yes, I use in, in, in some of cases. Uh, yeah. Here in Brazil, you, here in Brazil, uh, uh, the health system, we have a public health system and private health system. Basically, it's divided in these two options. For mm -hmm. private health yeah. system patients, uh, they provide us for every single surgery. But in the public mm -hmm. health system, we don't have available for for every single case. So every time you can do that, we use. But I have to say that the neurophysiologists, they do not agree uh, too much in this, in this technique. They use only because they use it, but uh, I, I never change, I never change uh, the surgery uh, by the information provided by this technique. Unfortunately, I would love to. But uh, in, in practice, yeah. it, it's not very useful for this kind of surgery. Thank you. So may I ask one question? So I think I agree with your op opinion. The, so it's very important to complete the resection of the optic strut. So. Uh, which can be obstacle to insert the clip blade to paracrinoid aneurysms. So uh, would you please let me know the, what instrument can you recommend to, uh, to safely and completely resect the remnant optic strut? So would you? Uh, it, it, so it only must, drilling? So, so. The, it must be a very small tip of drilling yeah yeah there there is another there is another uh, 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 tool that remove the bone without uh, performing a, a, a drilling a, a running uh, mm -hmm. a rolling yeah, that you just touch in the 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 bone it starts to remove the bone which, which seems to be safer. Yeah, it's a, a bone, a bony ultrasonic. Mm. Uh, yeah, bone kisa, bone kisa. Yeah, so th this this is good for posterior clinoid when you perform a transcavernous approach for basilar, and there is, mm. for example, it's easier and safer because you are working in the deep field, and, and if you are using something that is running like that, it can wrap it in a piece of 
arachnoid and vessel, it, it is a disaster. And so mm -hmm. it, using this Cusa Boni, it's, I think it's very good when you are deep or, or, or very close to the uh, uh, optic nerve or carotid. What, what I'm doing using a drill is to use my suction in the left hand and displacing mm -hmm. a little bit the, the carotid. That's why it's very important to remove the, the whole circumferential aspect of the distal dura ring. Because when you do that, it's easy to displace the carotid. Because the carotid is attached in the distal dura ring. When you cut it, you can easily displace laterally and then you can use, you displace and then you have a space for use the drill without to touch in the carotid. So, yeah. So this, this is this is the way I do it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions for my co-host Libun Sen? Professor yeah. Otani, thank you very much for your comments, your questions. My my pleasure and honor to to have you also. Yeah, here. me too. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. thanks, Professor Oliveira, for a very nice lecture. Professor, I just want to ask you regarding the angiogram. Uh, how often do we need to look for other blood supply to the ophthalmic artery uh, beside of uh, to the ophthalmic uh, nerve beside ophthalmic artery uh, in case that uh, intraoperatively you may need to sacrifice the ophthalmic artery and also maybe uh, if you have injury to the ophthalmic artery whether you want to decide whether to to do uh, end to end uh, uh, anastomosis of it so how you make the decision do you use VEP or or, or other other modality my second question, Professor, now there's increased belief that uh, for giant paracranial aneurysm, uh, the parsatility is the problem that caused the neurological deficit. Hence, uh, for the endovascular people, they said by doing a coiling or flow diverter, even without removing the mass effect, uh, removing the parsatility, we improve the neurological deficit. So what is your comment? Thank you, Professor. Yeah, I, I've never. Fortunately, I've never caused any lesion in the in the ophthalmic artery. Yeah, but that's why you have to have some blood flow intraoperative assessment. The ICG is the best for that, I believe, and you you have to put your clips and make sure that you have un, anterograde flow. Sometimes you have a retrograde flow, and if you if you are, you are not uh, pay attention in the direction of the flow, it seems it seems to be that everything is okay, but it's not. Uh, you have that's why the the very first ICG injection is very important. In the very first injection, you can see uh, the direction of the flow. After the second or third injector, you have a red ICG inside the vessel. You have a red fluorescence there. And sometimes you think that the flow is okay, but it's not okay. So that's, it's not easy. It's not easy. So you have to, to pay attention in the very first injector after you put the clip. That, that's that's my, main, my main advice in, in that situation. And we have to have the, the, the balloon test occlusion to see the whole uh, collaterals. And what was your last question about? The parsatality cause, causing the neurological deficit. Yeah, not, not because of the mass lesion, but because of parsatility. So by doing an endovascular, be, yes. Be, because of what? Uh, the parsatility, the parsatal, passation, passation that caused neurological okay. deficit okay. and not the mass effect. Yes. Yeah. So, when I was when I was resident, that there there are some neurosurgeons saying that uh, uh, if you treat the aneurysm using coilings, you 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 can finish the pulsation and you can solve the problem, but it's not like that all the time. The the visual deficit uh, pathophysiology it's multifactorial. It's not one single. Uh, you have the direct compression, uh, the aneurysm of the nerve, okay? 
you have the pulsation. You have the indirect compression inside the optic canal. And also, when you have a thrombosis and you have a sclerotic wall, you have different situations that can cause the visual death. So the only way to understand that it's in the microsurgical, looking by the microscope to see which mechanism it's you find in that in every single case. And the, if you find just a direct compression, okay, decompression, it, it's over. I have the direct compression, indirect compression, so I have to open the optic canal. So I, I have also thrombosis part. I have to open it to remove the thrombos and the sclerosis. So you, if you have those situations, you have to remove that. If you remove only the the one one factor, the other is still working on the visual death. So I believe that that if you remove all uh, the mechanisms that you find in the surgery, you give a higher chance for the patient to recover. But remember that the most important factor is the time. Uh, if you if you if you treat the patient in the very very early beginning of the symptoms, the chance of recovery is good. But if the patient has one month, two months, six months of the visual death, the chance of recovery is very poor. For me, it's a great pleasure to talk with you guys in this session, especially for such a great professor. Professor Tani, Professor Liu, Professor Kimura, uh, Professor Haja, and every one of you that are participating, thank you very much. I hope I, we can do it in person in Japan. I'd love to visit you guys in Japan uh, uh, soon. And uh, I, I will be right here, uh, up to you. Every time you want to, to have me, I, I will be right for you here to talk about uh, cerebrovascular, skull-based tumors. We are ready all the time for you. Thank you for uh, uh, Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons. Thank you very much. Professor Otani? Uh, thank you so much. So I can get uh, so many knowledge through uh, your presentation. So, so thank you so much. So uh, next, uh, so let's move on the uh, Dr. Raja. Thank you very much. We had a wonderful discussion as well. And I would like to close this officially now on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato. I would like to thank the speaker, Professor Jean G. D. Oliveira and Chair, Professor Naoki Otani for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. My sincere thanks to Professor Shubin for broadcasting the webinar on the WeChat channel. And today we have around 1,900 neurosurgeons who have joined live on all platforms combined. 1,900. <laughs> Thank you very much for every one of you uh, sharing your you. time with us. Thank you very so, much. Sincere thanks to my co-host Liu Boon Seng as well for joining in me today. So I think it's time we'll say goodbye to you. Thank you very much for joining.